What's up, guys? I'm here at PAX West with Stay Safe. Wow. And uh, we're actually sitting here getting ready for story time with Ian Hazakostas. So this is the opening ceremony. And uh, thought, why not record it? Maybe post it on YouTube. So hope you guys enjoy. join us this morning for coming out to hear me tell my story. This is a crazy, surreal experience. I'm excited, humbled by the invitation. Um, so for those of you who haven't watched one of these talks before, did a bunch of research, but watched the last like 10 years or so online to help prepare, this is the theme of story time. It's a developer talking about their own personal journey, their story in the game industry, and that's what I'm gonna be doing. Maybe some lessons learned along the way. If you're hoping to learn about the next cloud patch, Sorry, this is, this is not going to be that kind of talk. There you go, dude. So, it's been a crazy month. Um, August 2018, we stand here at the end of it. Uh, two and a half weeks ago, we just released this game, a little game called Battle for Azeroth. Uh, it's been amazing seeing millions of people around the world jump in and just dig into exploring this labor of love of the entire World of Warcraft team over the last two plus years. But when the PAX reached out to me, the, the invitation to come give this talk, it was, on the one hand, the worst conceivable timing since kind of <laughs> had a game to, to release. On the other hand, actually, really, really fitting timing, because I've been reflecting on my own journey and how the, the events that led me to this point. Because, actually, ten years ago, on this very day, I was starting to lose an entertainment. My first week at Blizzard, my first week on the World of Warcraft team, had just finished. I had just thrown out from the East Coast. I was living in temp housing, out of a suitcase, got in the night before. I woke up crazy early in the morning, I make some nerves, and still being at East Coast time, called the Yellow Cab to take me to Blizzard offices. This was way before Lyft and Uber were a thing, and I didn't have a car yet since I just moved out here. And I was standing there at like 7, 7.30, looking up at these gates. I was pretty much the only one there, because this is a game development studio, and it was 7 in the morning. But <laughs> <laughs> I was excited, anxious, a little scared, but above all, just eager to begin this next step in my journey. And part of why it was so, so impactful, though, was not just the fact that I was in here at the campus of this, this company that had made games that played throughout my entire life that I, I idolized, but because of, in some other ways, how unlikely it was. Because actually five years prior, 15 years ago today, I was actually sitting in a classroom just like this at NYU School of Law, beginning my third year as a law student, taking a criminal procedure class. And I had been following what felt like a pretty steady path throughout my entire life. Uh, really, as, you know, as long as I can remember, I wanted to be a lawyer. And maybe when I was like five, I wanted to be an astronaut, but that was a phase. <laughs> but for most intended purposes, you know, it, it, this is a goal that I had pursued, and, and there was a fair amount of certainty and comfort there. You know, and I had a job lined up for after I graduated. Life was good. I think my interest in the law you know, actually goes back quite a ways, like when I was like 11 or 12 doing some summer reading, actually read this book, John Grisham's The Firm. And it wasn't the, the money laundering for the mob, but that, that, was, that was appealing. It, it was actually the first part of the book, reading about a young lawyer's graduating from law school, going looking for law firms. Spoilers, he picked the wrong one. But <laughs> the details, the minutiae, the day-to-day -day work, the sorts of problems, the real legal talk that fleshed out the background of the story, actually fascinated me. I wanted to learn more. It sounded really cool, it sounded really interesting to me. So I talked to some family and friends, sought out whatever resources I could, and everything I learned about the law appealed to me. And I, throughout my life, I've always liked solving puzzles, I've liked, you know, problems. And that's how I viewed the law. I think mean, at its core, legal practice is basically taking a puzzle that consists of a set of facts, a set of laws, some extra resources, like maybe interpretations of those laws, other documents that have been written, and solving a puzzle that is, what is the best argument you can make given these fixed things in support of this position? And it wasn't just about making the argument, that was the first half of it, 
You might have this perfect idea in your head or some thought, but you also needed to be able to express it, to convince others through, the, through word, written, spoken, of the validity of your argument. And in the course of making that argument, you might often realize that it wasn't quite as perfect as you imagined. And you could do all of this in service of protecting rights, in service of society as a whole. What was someone's not to like? And so I was sold. I was hooked. Um, a lot of the choices I made from that point on, classes I took, extracurriculars I pursued, they were all in service of this idea in my you know, back then for like 11, 12, I'm going to be a lawyer when I grow up. And so when I got to college, a few years down the line, I you know, took classes that were tailored to that goal. And four years later, when I made it to NYU and was starting law school there, it felt like I was, you know, I realized this dream I had 10 years ago. It, it felt pretty amazing. And there's something to be said for that. And it was, you know, I, had, I felt like I had this great life ahead of me that I had planned for. And yet, as we just saw, not that many years later, I found myself standing in front of the gates of Blizzard on a cool morning in Irvine. So what happened? And there's another side of my life that maybe makes it not quite as crazy. Let's take a look at that. Going way, way back, 1983, you know, this, was a, this was a big year in the life of Yoni and Hazard Postis. I was getting ready to start my first year of preschool. <laughs> <laughs> also, I had just been introduced to a world that would you know, captivate me throughout the rest of my life to come. So my mother was an elementary school teacher. She taught first grade. I was actually transitioning to being a computer teacher as computers began to get more and more of a place in, in schools around the country. And so based on some of those readings, and you know, she, she was reading about the value of educational software, computers to develop the young minds. We brought home this uh, Texas Instruments TI-99 4A and had, you know, some you know, definitely, there was some educational software, played some number games, spelling games, other, other things along those lines. But as we've seen, if there's a device that can have games on it, it will have games on it. It doesn't matter whether it's a calculator or whatever it is. <laughs> and so, out of all those, the one that sticks out in my mind the most, and I don't expect maybe or even any of you to play this or remember it, but this game was called Tunnels of Doom. And this game that came out in 1982 was actually crazy ahead of its time in a lot of ways. It was basically a roguelike. Um, it was a 10-layer procedurally generated dungeon. You make a party of adventurers at the start, and your goal was to make it to the lowest level of the dungeon when you could rescue a king who was trapped there. And you, you know, explore, defeat monsters, randomly generated levels each time, buy weapons and shops along the way, and if you lost, game over, try again. When I first started playing this, I really was a bit too young, couldn't make heads and tails like this, spent a lot of time exploring the top levels and getting nowhere, but I was still captivated. And then over the course of the next couple of years, I made greater strides and eventually managed to get to the depths of the dungeon. And it was a, it was a great triumph at the time. But it really opened my eyes to this whole world of fantasy and imagination and, you know, looking beyond simple graphics and lines and pixels and dreams of adventure and progression and rewards and a lot of things that I would continue to seek out in games across the rest of my life. Just kind of a, a quick tour through some of those. So a few years later, slightly better graphics. Um, for context, you know, I, was, I was an Nintendo kid and I was an Apple kid. Uh, my mother was still an educator. We had educational discounts on Apple computers and player bags. So that's what we had around the house. I never actually had a standard PC computer until many, many, many years later when I was in law school when I actually needed a laptop for exam taking software. So in the meantime, the games that I played were the ones that were available in that universe. And of course, it's a big part of what attracted me to Blizzard games in the first place because all of the games from the 90s ended up on the map, which was unusual at the time. One thing, though, that stands out not better graphics in the upper right here, which have a bunch of text. And so in the 90s, we started to see the emergence of the very first online multiplayer games. Back then, these were bulletin board door games that you could call into a computer, which had been pained by just a random hobbyist, and play through these games, often taking turns, where only one person at a time could connect. 
This was something that my friends and I were super into when we were junior high school, early high school. And these games opened my eyes to the possibility that gaming wasn't just about sitting next to somebody on a couch and sharing that experience with them, but that it could bring people together from much greater distances. You could even meet people through these online games. And later, again, slightly nicer graphics, pretty cool game called Diablo there in the upper right. That was a pretty big fixture in 1998 for me. But in the lower right, again, another text-based online game, a mod, a multi-user dungeon. And these are really the progenitors of the MMORPG in a lot of ways. You think of them as MMORPGs, that they weren't massive, but there were hundreds of people, maybe, participating in these worlds. There were persistent environments with drama and buffs and nerfs and balance, and a lot of the things that came to define the MMO genre thereafter. I spent quite a bit of time playing a couple of them, and actually, at some point when I was taking some college programming classes, a few online friends and I tried to start a row and spent you know, a few months puzzling through the idea of coming up with our own classes and spells and building our own world. And it was enthralling. And so, the sum of all this is that from the earliest age, when I was four onwards, I had been immersing myself in a wide variety of these games, often with progression elements, often with online components, and training myself in a way that wasn't even conscious at the time, but because of Stuff I mentioned earlier with how I like to approach things as puzzles and problems to be untangled and unraveled. I was just naturally thinking about what, what worked, what didn't, what I liked, what I didn't, what frustrated me. I got to see how buffs or nerfs played out in some of these online environments and learn lessons from that. I, I was doing what was actually, you know, in a sense, building a skill set. Um, Slight digression, you often hear game developers, game designers talk about someone, whether it's praising a colleague or evaluating an interview candidate. They'll talk, they'll talk about someone's design instincts. Someone has good instincts, or someone has questionable instincts. And, and instinct is a funny word, because it, it makes it sound like you sprang fully formed from the womb destined to make games. Like it's, you know, a baby bird in its nest. But that, that's not what instinct means in this case. Instinct is more a reflection of something that we as humans are just naturally adept at, which is consolidating vast amounts of information and experience into finding patterns, and then using that to guide our intuition, to guide what you can think of as instinct. You know, consider chess, for example. A novice chess player might look at a board and evaluate every possible move one at a time, thinking through, if I do this, then she does that, and then I can do this, oh wait, never mind, that's bad, or we go down a different direction. A master who has spent thousands of hours and looked at hundreds of thousands of positions might just have an intuitive sense looking at a board within a matter of a second or two of uh, this is a strong position or this is a weak position, or might even see a winning move. And that's effectively the pattern recognition, that is the consolidation of vast amounts of experience, and that's something that guides designers, guides people in almost any creative area where you can't possibly evaluate every possible, every, every, every possibility, you have to have something to guide you and pick one or the other. Anyway, that's effectively what I've been doing. That's effectively how I've been training myself in the course of just living my life and having fun. And there's a couple of books I'd recommend if you're interested in learning more about sort of the, the formation of those thought processes or the factors that lead people to success and much, much more. And there's many, many talks worth of information contained in these books, but they're both great reads. Now, I just want to take a second to make it clear, as I was assembling these slides, it occurred to me, I didn't want to paint a misleading picture. Um, my life wasn't just, okay, I played a bunch of video games for 20 years, and that was what prepared me to be a game developer, to be a game designer down the line. And I think there's a lot more to it than that, there's a lot more to me than that. Um, it's a random example, so if, you, if you've looked at my name, it may not come as a huge surprise that I have some Greek heritage. My father was born in Greece, and when I was growing up, the bedtime stories that he would read me were actually Greek myths. Uh, those were my fairy tales. It was Perseus and Medusa, Theseus and the Minotaur, Heracles and his labors trying to atone for the gods. Those were the stories that captivated me and transported me. And as soon as I you know, could read better, those were some of the first books that I sought out and asked my parents for so I could learn more. And later on, you know, whenever I could, I wanted to delve more deeply into those worlds, into other mythologies. That interest actually led me 
went to high school to take Latin instead of German or French or Spanish or something more conventional because I wanted to be closer to these stories that had helped just shape my imagination when I was young. Also collected a ton of baseball cards, was super into baseball. Uh, when I was 10 or 11, I probably could have named the starting roster of every major league baseball team. A lot of number crunching, and again, just a totally separate facet of, of the interest that I was exploring. Speaking of numbers, I always liked math. Uh, like puzzles, I, I like math puzzles. I was actually the captain of my high school math team, just to give you the level of nerd we're talking about here. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty high, it's um, And even the high school theater. Uh, I, it was a mix of you know, following trends into this, but wanting to challenge myself, wanting to take more risks, wanting to learn a bit about what could lead me to be up on stage and be a bit vulnerable in front of a crowd of people, not quite this size of the crowd, but, but it was something. Um, and the point is, there's a lot more to me than just the games that I play, but there's a lot more to anyone who comes into the game industry than just the games that they've played. The games are a piece of it, but they're not a whole. I think with any art form, and, and that's what games are, there's mastery and knowledge of the craft, but there's also the perspective that you bring to it. I think one of the cool things about the game industry is that really it's only very recently were there formal programs that you could take to prepare you for game development. Almost everybody has some different stories, just to keep up like 10, 15 years. They started out with some different client life, a different set of interests that led them there. And so whether, you're, whether it's you know, someone who has a fascination with history that informs their world building, or someone who is an outdoorsman who's hiking and camping, and those pictures, those images seared on their mind, or makes them, or, or guides their environment art. And everyone brings something, some new perspective, and that's what actually expands the view, as well as just enabling it. Anyway, slight digression. Let's go back to our story. So, 2004, I graduated from law school, I moved down to Washington, D.C. for my very first real job as an adult. I was working as a clerk for a federal appellate judge in D.C. And this was an amazing job. Uh, it was everything I had hoped the law would be. It was everything I wanted it to be. Uh, I was working with kind, smart, talented people, helping to research and evaluate litigants' positions and their briefs, and help my judge reach conclusions of law. And these were important things that I've you know, seen newspaper headlines once they were decided. And so I was doing interesting, fascinating work, and I was making a difference in the world. Life was still good. Things were good. Now, after I got settled, and about three months after that, there was this game that came out. <laughs> and so I've been a huge Lizard fan all my life. I you know, played Warcraft 2 and dialogue with friends in high school, and was, was steeped in this world. But I'll be honest, I hadn't actually paid a ton of attention to the details of World of Warcraft. I had just graduated from law school, taken the bar exam, relocated my whole life, was moving. And so while I knew about World of Warcraft, I hadn't played the data, I didn't really know all the details. But I had, you know, at this point I had some free time, I had settled into a new routine, was looking for a new game to play. This seemed like the perfect time. And so for a while, I was going to, you know, my plan was to just hop on a random server and go from there. But I decided to reach out to a friend of mine in Owen, who had played some online games with in the past, just to ask, hey, are you going to play World of Warcraft? If so, and any recommendation on what server I should pick? And he said, yeah, well, yes, I'm definitely playing. I'm playing with this big internet forum guild. Uh, you should come join us. We're going forward. And so I said, sure, why not? I did. Faithful decision that would shape the next 14 years of my life. <laughs> made just really on the spur of the moment. And it was Thanksgiving break, and I had a winter recess coming up for the court, so I actually had a fair bit of free time. I really jumped in and started exploring and immersing myself in this world. And going in relatively blind actually made it even more magical, I think. It, more so than if I had played the beta or had been reading about it religiously for the prior months. Because every adventure, every place I went was a new discovery, and it was the best game I'd ever played. There's no question about it. And really became a fixture for me going forward. Now, I was just one person in this giant guild with hundreds of people. Yeah, it was just internet forums guild, not like a tight knit group of friends, just anybody who wanted to join, anybody who wanted to play together, who was a member of this community. But as, you know, as time passed, early 2005, I was max level, 
and the group started making their first explorations into the game's first big raid zone, this place called Molten Core, a 40 player dungeon. And so they were looking for warm bodies because there weren't that many people max level at the time, and so I volunteered and tagged along. Now, back then, the game's user interface was very, very simple. And even though this was a 40 player group, the UI by default only actually let you see the other four players in your five player party. And I had the misfortune of being placed in a group that didn't have a healer, which meant that no one could actually see that I was injured, let alone target me to heal me, which meant that I spent like 90% of the way dead. And it was super fun. And it was, you know, seeing this thing that only a few thousand people in the world had seen at this point, and we failed repeatedly and got nowhere. <laughs> but it was awesome. World of Warcraft in 2005, ladies and gentlemen. We went back, reassembled the group, maybe with a little bit more ambition this time, a bit more plan. But things were still, things were still rough. You know, we, we made it a bit further in, but for those of you who play it and remember World of War, there are these mobs called Ancient Warhounds that would respawn very frequently. <laughs> and as we slowly were slogging our way through the place, very commonly one of them would respawn right on top of our group, kill us, and it's like, all right, back to the entrance. And <laughs> very slow going. Now, well, for whatever reason, I happen to have one of these on my desk, not this exact thing, but something that looked a whole lot like it. I have no really good explanation. I think I basically used this a little like fidget clicker thing before fidget spinners and cubes and stuff existed. But I happened to notice that there was a pattern to what the courthouse were doing, that they would respawn every 15 to 18 minutes or so. And so I started timing them. I actually used the physical stopwatch. When we killed them, I would start the timer. And actors started calling out. I spoke up for one of the first times on our voice comms, who's been Trillo at the time, and said, hey, you know, this is when it's safe to move up. We should wait, respawn soon. And before I knew it, after about 20, 30 minutes of this, I was basically de facto leading the raid because I was telling the group when it was safe to move, when it wasn't, where to stand, and when. And it turns out a lot of the time, in order to lead effectively, you just need to step up and do it. Um, there's, there's hard work that is desired, and as soon as you can perform a valuable function, people will listen. And that, that basically went from being the anonymous member of the raid group dying repeatedly in a group with no healing to the group's raid leader over the course of a week or two. And so as we adventured further into the core, we eventually, over the course of weeks to come, defeated Ragnars, defeated Nixia. We were a full-fledged raiding guild. We were, you know, we could take pride in the fact, especially back then, there were only a few thousand people who had seen what we had seen, who had done what we had done. It felt amazing. Now, continuing further, Two raid zones later, there was this zone called Ankarash. It opened up in early 2006. And this is where my guild hit one of our first real brick walls. We were struggling with this encounter called the Twin Emperors. And I was pretty sure, that, that based on what I had seen, that we had found a serious bug with the encounter. It was a very specific technical bug that required, you know, if you were doing the strat that we were trying to do, we'd run into something that was posing a major setback. Now, at the time, that was actually, that posed certain challenges, because the culture in the WoW community was one of near absolute secrecy around raiding. This is something that had been inherited from the game EverQuest previously, where raid bosses were, you know, there's a single one in a public space, and if you killed it, another guild on the server couldn't. And so the knowledge of how to overcome encounters was something to be zealously guarded. And even though World of Warcraft encounters were instanced, the community had kind of carried that set of guidelines, those set of rules forward. And so I couldn't just go close on the forums, hey, this is what we're seeing, this is how we're doing the encounter, and this is the bug we're running into. So it was kind of lost. But I remember, speaking of EverQuest, that one of the lead developers of World of Warcraft actually been a well-known EverQuest creator in the past. And so I actually went to an old EverQuest build forum, where I knew he had posted long, long ago, made an account there, and sent him a private message saying, Hi, sorry to bother you. I think I have a bug. And I explained, and sent him a message, and thought nothing further on it. 
A couple days later, he got back to me. He thanked me for reporting the Bible, appreciated it, said in the future, if you want to reach out to me, don't, you know, you don't have to go to this forum, here's my email address. And so I began corresponding with this guy, sending him feedback, reporting bugs here and there where I could. Uh, the name he went by on those forums was Tiggle, or as we know him today, Papa Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Kaplan then, you know, the game designer of Warcraft, um, became an invaluable resource. I, I did my best to not take advantage of this, you know, lifeline, this direct connection that I had. But when I had feedback, when I had concerns, when I had bug reports to share, I would, I would send an email about And we continued to go on over the course of the rest of the expansion, and became a relatively solid great build. We were, at some point, one of the top you know, 10 or 20 in North America, at least. Burning Crusade, having elevated the game to new heights. I took a brief break somewhere along the line, just a little bit burned out after the Travis. But our guild was, you know, was doing great. And really, the life I was leading at this point was very much like Warder by day, Raid Leader by night. And <laughs> two separate worlds, uh, kind of closet gamer at work. No one would have guessed or no, and then I was going home, and I had this alter ego. And yeah, so our guild site, back then, it was very common. Everyone would have a guild website, you would post screenshots on it, you would you know, keep, up, keep, keep people up to date on your latest kills, not that anyone really cared for the most part, but it's just something you did. But in this case, a lot of people from other top guilds start coming to our guild, to our guild forums, to congregate, to discuss, to share information, to learn. And it was, it was a place where there were a lot of, a lot of smart people with varied backgrounds. Some of them were you know, graduate students studying math and statistics, others were programmers, others were actually developers in the industry, who all shared a common bent of liking analysis, liking to solve problems, liking to solve puzzles, and started to pick apart the way World of Warcraft worked. I think it's, it's a stretch to claim this is where theory crafting on the internet started, but I think it's definitely a part of that story. And so it was awesome seeing our humble built website become a nexus of discussion and analysis as people try to, for the first time, definitively answer, well, when you're playing this class, is it better to use this rotation or that rotation? Not just what feels better or what you think is better, but what is provably better. And this also, you know, I think, opened my eyes to the level of depth and analysis that was possible in some of these games, as well as expanding the community of awesome folks that I am you know, in contact with and gain contact with. I mean, there was somebody who was a member of the forums back then who was actually starting to apply to law school, who knew I was a lawyer, who reached out to message me to ask for advice of applying to law schools, uh, who's now actually completely separately himself a developer at Blizzard. <laughs> it's, a small world. It's, a it's a small world, and the internet makes it a smaller one, and it's, it's amazing. Uh, the first list kind of been held in 2005, but I, I wasn't nearly, you know, didn't know enough about the game back then to consider going. But by this point, it was something I knew I had to go to. And this was the first time meeting any of my guildmates face to face, who also made the trip out or who lived in California. It was also a chance for me to meet Jeff, who I've been corresponding with, and also to grab lunch with him and a couple of other folks like Alex Afraciani, who's now the creative director, or Scott Mercer, who was then the encounter designer, that I've been sending feedback to as well, and reaching out to and kind of corresponding with, but as a player to developer. And then to this day, um, I have people occasionally reach out and send messages, whether it's on Twitter or Facebook or elsewhere. And I do my best to try to respond to as many as I can because I remember how much it meant to me as a player to feel like I had this connection with the developer of the game that really was this massive central part of my life. And anything I can do to help share a bit of that feeling, to help pay a bit of that back, I want to do. So now, let's pull back a second to the other half of my life. So, after my one-year clerkship ended, unfortunately it was only a one-year gig, I would have kept doing that job forever if they'd let me, but it was you know, a time-related thing, and then I probably wouldn't be here. I went on to work at a law firm doing sort of large-scale commercial litigation, had a pretty significant amount of student debt to pay off coming out of law school, and so going to a firm like this was the best way to do it. 
And I was still working alongside a lot of smart kind of people, doing a lot of fascinating work, but also an increasing amount that wasn't quite as enthralling. And I think part of what modern litigation involves is this wonderful process called discovery, where you know, we need to settle a dispute. You ask the other side, but the other side is not a civil party, or it's the government. And vice versa, you ask, hey, can you give me all of the documents in your possession that relate to X? And they do. And maybe 30, 40 years ago, it was like, here's two boxes of stuff. Nowadays, it's, here are 3.7 gigabytes of text files from our entire exchange server, every email that might be potentially responsive. And guess who gets to go through and process a lot of those things? <laughs> Lawyers. Um, and so there was less of the puzzle solving, the problem solving that I loved, and a bit more like fishing through boxes to find the right puzzle pieces to even begin solving. And so I was, I was starting to look for something a bit different. Uh, I was applying for other legal jobs at the time, and reaching out in passing to my friend Helen, the same guy who recommended the Guild way back in 2004, to see, you know, just, just to kind of complain, honestly. Applying for jobs kind of sucks, like setting up letters, resumes, the general stress of it. And around this time, he actually confided in me in a secret. He had actually just gotten a job at Blizzard. Um, he had been a programmer previously, and kind of changed gears, largely inspired by his you know, heavy passion for World of Warcraft. And he was having a blast. Like, he, he loved it, he had no regrets whatsoever. But that opened a little door in my mind. It got me for the very first time thinking, like, wait, is that something I can do? And I quickly decided, no, of course not, that's stupid. I'm not a lawyer, I spent the last 10 years of my life Preparing for this, training for this, going to school. What do I know about game design anyway? That's dumb. But a few more months passed. And I had found a couple of other jobs, other legal jobs. Nothing that was super exciting to me, though. And that itch still remained. So I reached back out to Owen, and I said, Hey, does Blizzard have any design openings? Is, is there anything, like, might there any possibility there? And graciously, he agreed to act as a referral if I wanted to, to apply. And I wrote what I can say is probably one of the most ill-advised cover letters, <laughs> in which I said, literally, I don't know that I want this job. <laughs> <laughs> and it, so actually, I, it was true. I, I was like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm still a lawyer, but man, I'm so curious to learn more here. And I was really worried that my friend would be sticking his neck out, acting as a reference for me, and then I might just get cold feet back down the whole process part way through. But I applied, and then the next thing that happened was they sent me a design test. It was a lengthy series of questions, ranging from design three new abilities for this class for the next expansion, to how do you modify this encounter to be suitable for a different grade size, a bunch of stuff that I never really thought about before in those terms. But it was awesome. I spent the whole weekend just writing thousands of words in response to these questions. And I knew if I didn't go any further in the process, it was worth it just for that alone. It was, just, it was actually genuinely a super fun experience. But they actually invited me out for an interview. And so I flew out to California and found myself on the Lizard campus, getting ready for a day of face-to-face -face discussions with this development team that I had watched from afar and that I idolized. And again, kind of like doing the test, it was the most amazing experience. You know, as, as a closet game who had lived this kind of double life previously, actually sitting down in a professional setting you know, with the trappings of a job interview and debating class design for 30 minutes was surreal. It was awesome. I had, I had an amazing time. It was just like a whirlwind, fantastic little journey. And I got back on the plane, flew back to DC, and went back to work the next day. Thought nothing further about it. A month passed, and Blizzard well, reached back out to me and said, We want to offer you a job. And suddenly this all became super real. Because um, <laughs> it, it actually hadn't totally been up until that point, in all honesty, right? It was still like, Yeah, I mean, a lawyer, this is a life that I'm living, but I've had this amazing little side journey, and this, this was just fantastic. But then I had the very real question of, am I going to walk away from my career? Am I going to walk away from financial security, from one side of the country to the other, all of these things? I 
reaching out to friends and family for advice. My parents initially thought I lost my mind. <laughs> um, <laughs> like, wait, you want to do what? Um, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized I had to. Because if I didn't, I realized this was a lost of life and opportunity, truly. I was incredibly fortunate to have had it come across my lap. And if I didn't, odds were good I was going to wake up one day, whether it was a month later, whether it was a year later, whether it was five years later, or come home after a hard day at work, feeling a bit down, and I'd have that moment of regret, that moment of wondering, what would it have been like? What if I could chase this opportunity? And I didn't want to feel that way. So I, I took some safety precautions. I talked to a, you know, I gave myself one year. I talked to a recruiter to make sure I wasn't completely damaging my future career prospects. I took a year off from the law. But I said, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna take a chance, just as Blizzard took a gigantic chance on me, an unproven developer. I'm gonna take a chance. I'm gonna see if I like it, if I'm any good at it, if they like me. And so that brings us back to where our story began. As I was standing in front of these gates, on that morning in August 2008, excited and looking ahead to this next chapter of my life. And I walked in. And I was arriving at a very eventful time in the company. Summer 2008, which is a couple of months before Wrath of Lich King came out, the second expansion for World of Warcraft. This was a super, super busy time uh, as the last stretch, the last sprint to the finish line before expansion can be. At the end of my first week, Jeff Kaplan actually called the whole design team together and said, hey, we have three and a half weeks to make the game the players deserve. To finish it, to do everything in our power to make this memorable. And this was our charge, was, this was kind of the last sprint to the finish. And there was a lot of work left to be done. He came aside and talked to me afterwards to say, hey, you, know, you just got here, don't feel any pressure or obligation. You know, this, this doesn't apply to you, this is more just everyone has a lot more on their plate they need to finish up. They don't feel any obligation to, to stay later than the answer. I looked at it like he was insane. Like at the time, I was living in temp house and I had a suitcase. Was I going to go home and watch bad TV in a town where I knew no one? Or was I going to stay at the office and make World of Frickin' Warcraft? <laughs> <laughs> World of Frickin' Warcraft. Um, at the time, also, so. We were a little bit less efficient in, in some ways than we are these days. Uh, back then, the entire zone of, of Ice Town, the top end of North Run, the continent where the expansion was set, was basically 70% empty. There were zero creatures in it. It did not look like the place where the armies of the Lich King were to be found. Because that's, that's part of the nature of, of a live product to some extent. I think you know, Blizzard is very well known for, and we should take it when they're ready, but in a live game, to some extent, quantity and timeliness is quality. Right, making people wait 12 months for something new, that's, that's not doing the right thing for our players. But I had, I had the immediate amazing experience of my initial work, literally the things that I did on my first days of the company. I could come back after the weekend and go to player fan sites and see that work on the front page of those fan sites because a new beta built had been pushed out and had been data on it. And that was surreal to me. Like I had gone from playing this game to, I just put something in it, and other people are playing it, literally overnight. It was crazy. So Wrath came out, and I fell into a new role as a dungeon and raid encounter sign. That was my, that was my first job, formally, on Wrath of the And I loved it, I mean, I, I, I knew pretty quickly that I wasn't going to need a year for this trial period, that I, I was, I was sold. This was a place I was very happy in, working around awesome people, working on this game that I loved. But even so, there were some early challenges. Uh, I think one of the biggest ones was actually becoming adjusted, becoming used to the creative process. All through my life previously, I had worked and lived in a domain of certainty. That's what I've been conditioned to do. From a young age, right, whether it's an elementary school teacher asking, what's seven times nine? And I would raise my hand and I knew that it was 63 and that was an answer that I could give and be recognized and rewarded and praised for giving that answer. Or years later in high school, it's like a US history teacher asking, what's the XYZ affair and what was its impact on late 18th century US French relations? If I didn't know it, I was going to stay quiet, but if I knew it, I'd be that obnoxious kid raising his hand saying, ooh, me, because I had an answer to share. But if I didn't 
know I was right, why open my mouth? Why take that risk? Now take that logic, take that upbringing, take that training, and transplant it into a creative environment. It's, it's apples and oranges, it's night and day difference. If we're sitting around with a group discussing boss mechanics, like there's a skeletal frost dragon, what should that dragon do? What is right? What is wrong? What is smart? What is stupid? What's a good idea? What's a bad idea? How could I have the confidence to open my mouth and say, well, what, what if the dragon encases some players in ice and their allies have to hide behind those ice blocks and break them out? Is that smart? How should I know? How should anyone know? And so there's something terrifying, actually, about vocalizing these thoughts and expose them to the judgment of others without any knowledge of whether they're good or bad. And it's something that I think you almost never let go of entirely. I've heard people, very senior folks at Blizzard, people with lead, people with director in the title, who will preface something they say in a meeting with, this is a terrible idea, but... And, and there's that little bit of deflection, there's that little bit of a, of a safety net of like, I, I don't know if this is good either, but bear with me. And even to this day, I sometimes catch myself, you know, looking around the room as I begin to speak, sharing a thought, looking for micro-reactions on people's faces to know whether they're, you know, whether, whether they think it's good or whether there's some level of disgust or mockery. But, and I think what follows from that is it's something that's essential. That's how the creative process works. It's how brainstorming works. It's something that I needed to get past. But it's also something that now in my role as a leader, I think for anyone out there who is facilitating or trying to organize a creative group, a creative process, I think the most important thing you can do is make sure that it feels like a safe place to share those ideas, that there's never a sense of judgment or something that's going to make somebody withdraw and refrain from offering their opinion next time. Because without that, the final result, the whole ends up being poor. I think that was, a, that was a major, a huge takeaway for me over the course of that initial onboarding and shifting my thinking from a legal framework to a creative design framework. Moving on, a couple of years later, Cataclysm expansion. Um, as this was coming out, I actually made a shift from working on encounter design to working on class design. And I was still trying to juggle it to where I could, but my primary job was coming up with new abilities, tuning, balancing, improving the overall feel of several of the little crafts character classes. And I would try this thing with a raid boss when I could every patch or so as a great way to kind of shift gears to get a creative block in one area. I would focus my attention on the other until I could come back. But I learned a lot from, from this process. You know, on paper, balance feels like objective math, right? It feels like something grounded in those areas of certainty I was talking about earlier. But it's not always. So, here's an anecdote from early in capitalism. Now, in our game, we have a Death Knight class that has two different specializations that both deal damage. One is a holy, one is frost. And by this point, several years after the, the origins of, you know, my guild forums, the community was, was very adept at sharing and breaking down knowledge. They collected combat logs, aggregated them, and processed them. You could see almost like the stock market index based on every night's raids. Even you knew who was doing how well, and players definitely let us know. So in this world, there was a sense that, you know, Frost was lagging a bit behind and holding in most situations. And Frost that night justifiably reached out to us and said, why are you hate us, Blizzard? <laughs> I just want to play the specialization that I enjoy, but everyone knows we're terrible. Yeah. And so we looked at the numbers and, you know, our own internal data, simulations, and we realized, that we, hey, we think they're right. Frost is a few percent behind a holy. Let's make some finely calibrated adjustments to Frost to bring them up so that they're equal to a holy. <laughs> and so that's what we did. And then a week passed. We pushed our changes to Frost 5, and this is what happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out, and those are simpler, or, or more complicated than just an abstract set of numbers, there are people behind these characters. The human psychology is a fascinating thing. What happened was, 
steered craft with number crunchers, looked at our changes, and said, Frost is now a fraction of a percent better than unholy under optimal circumstances. <laughs> which then was translated to, Frost is the new best fight to play. <laughs> which then meant that all of the very best players who cared most about min maxing, who, like, for whom making that number the biggest it could be was their source of joy in the game, the base switch that brought from Unholy to Frost. If you look at this chart, you would think we had nerfed Unholy. In fact, not long later, Unholy players were like, why did you nerf us? Why do you hate Unholy? Moral <laughs> <laughs> the story, that was as hard as it seems. So later this year, and obviously BlizzCon has been largely annual event, but BlizzCon 2010 was a, was a special one for me. Because it was actually my first BlizzCon where I had a role on stage. I was asked for the first time to be part of a QA and a panel with the other class and systems designers. And up until this point, I'd actually lied to my guildmates. Back then, it's, you know, so it was considered the most important that no one should know that you were a developer of Blizzard when you were playing World of Warcraft. I told my guildmates that I was working in a law firm in LA. I had to tell them I switched posts because time zone had changed. But even at BlizzCon 2008, 2009, I had hung out with them. I just kind of still did it like a player would. Um, because at you know, some level, this reflected the fact that I was still living a double life in a sense. Yes, I was going to work and I was making bosses in World of Warcraft and I was adjusting classes and doing those sorts of things. But I hadn't fully embraced what my life was, I hadn't fully embraced my identity as a Blizzard game developer yet. When Wrath of the Lich King came out, uh, Blizzard posted a local signing event in the Orange County area for people to come bring their collective traditions and get them signed on the development team. I didn't go to that. I stayed home and played the game and just drove it midnight. <laughs> because I was still a wild player more than I was a wild developer. I didn't think of myself as deserving to be there to sign that box. I had just worked on the game for a few weeks, not the years these people had. That wasn't really where I felt comfortable. This BlizzCon changed that. They had to break the news to my guildmates the night before at dinner. Hey, by the way, you might see me on stage tomorrow. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the last vestiges of the old life I still clung to, I had left behind. So, moving on, another couple of years, Mist of Fenaria, our fourth expansion. Now, at the start of Mist, uh, Scott Mercer, who had been leading counter designer on World Warcraft for many years, one of the folks I had met and had lunch with at BlizzCon way, way back five years earlier, decided he wanted to, after a decade of service on the World Warcraft team, move on to a different project within Blizzard, <laughs> leaving the leading counter position. And I didn't know that I was ready for it. But, you know, being a typically almost like a vicious by default sort of person, it's like, hey, there's a job, it's a promotion, you should apply for it. I applied for it. And in the course of the interview process, uh, a then lead producer, now our production director, John Hyde, asked me a question over lunch. Ian, why do you want to stop making things? Why do you want to be a lead? Why do you want to be a manager instead? And I did not have a good answer to that question because I hadn't really fully thought of it in those terms up until that point. It's a question I still ask people in interviews today when they want to move from being individual contributors to being leaders. Because it's very different doing X versus leading people and mentoring them and guiding them as they do X, whatever that may be. And this trap that people often fall into where your best artist or your best engineer or best whatever gets promoted into a position where they no longer are actually making art or no longer are actually writing code. And maybe they're not as good a manager. Maybe they're not as good a leader. But they were conditioned to think, like, this is the next step they should take in life. And they end up less happy, and the team as a whole ends up worse off because they've lost a great source of contribution. And John wanted to make sure that I wasn't falling into that trap. I actually took, took a lot of time to reflect on that. And it occurred to me that this is actually what I wanted to do. I, you know, it, there were a lot of parallels, a lot of lessons I learned from actually raid leading. I've never been the best player in my raid group. I wasn't the single most skilled raider. But I was good at identifying the strengths and weaknesses of the group and assigning them to roles that suited those strengths and weaknesses. 
and facilitating and smoothing out conflicts and helping people work through the challenges that come with trying to cooperate and get something done on a large scale. And that's what I threw myself into at work from that point forward. I think when I first moved into the role, I actually had, had a meeting with my account design team who had been my peers just days earlier. And one of the first things I said to them was, uh, please, I don't want you to, to forget this. I'm not suddenly magically a better designer or smarter or have better ideas than I did yesterday just because I have the word in my title right now. Um, don't think of me that way. Just think of me as a resource who can help you. Who can, if you have problems that I can help you with, I can help you solve, let me know. And I think this began a transition and a shift into thinking more as a leader, more as a manager, and less as a doer, less as an implementer. And yeah, so this was one of the first giant great things we set out to tackle uh, from Thunder. I think one of the big goals for us over the course of the secondary expansion was to do more, to do it faster, to keep our level of quality with the same team size that we've had in Cataclysm. And over the course of this expansion, we made literally twice as many great as we had in Cataclysm, in my opinion, without sacrificing quality. And I think this, that has set a standard to the benchmark the World of Warcraft has tried to carry forward since then in terms of how ambitious we are, how large our ways are, what we try to accomplish with them. Now, moving into more of uh, I another opportunity opened up and I shifted from being a leading counter designer to a lead game designer. And I think this kind of reconciled my early background in doing subsystems work and doing some creative encounter work. And it was for me a best of both worlds. I was interested in all sides of the game. And this let me actually, you know, explore all of them simultaneously. But as I moved into this role, I started to, to notice something. That the way that I related to people, the way that other people related to me, was changing as my responsibility shifted, as my, as my title changed over the years. And the process that I followed for getting ideas into the game wasn't actually playing out the way that it was done. You know, when I was a new designer in the World of Warcraft team, if I had an idea, I had a suggestion, something I thought we should do, whether it was small or big, I might start out by bouncing it off my peers, folks sitting at desks right near me to see what they thought, if I had any suggestions. If I still liked it and they seemed excited, I would let my lead know and say, hey, I had this idea, what if we, what if we tried doing X or Y? And if they liked it, then you know, we socialize it further with the other members of the team leadership and eventually it might make it into the game. If it did, it was almost certainly improved along the way by being challenged, by having a lot of questions, by having suggestions, things to augment it, introduced by every other person who shared it in the creative process. And a lot of the time, ideas that I woke up thinking were brilliant, I quickly realized were terrible after running by just a few people. But here, by 2014, as a lead game designer, I was actually having a much easier time getting my ideas into the game because there were way fewer people who could tell me no. <laughs> <laughs> and my ideas weren't necessarily better than they were five years earlier. I mean, maybe they were a bit more refined, maybe they were a bit more, you know, polished by lessons learned. But I was no longer going through the same process. This is forgive the cheesy metaphor, but I think this is a crucible, right? A crucible is something in, in blacksmithing that helps filter out impurities to create a better and stronger whole as your final product. And I think I've been putting my ideas through this process almost automatically by necessity, because if I didn't, well, then there was no way they were going to get into the game because there were gatekeepers between me and that. As I gained more responsibility on my team, I had to force this process to play out. I had to actively go seek out not just peers, but people on the team that worked for me, and as many different voices as I could find to run my ideas past, to challenge, so that this crucible could make them better for the sake of the game as a whole. And I think it's something that if you just, if, had I just continued to go about my business unconsciously, being like, well, yeah, I'll run my ideas past my boss, and then if they say yes, I'll put them in the game, then I think the game would have been worse off for it. So then, I was getting closer to the present day, after that I have 
probably fewer, fewer lessons, fewer insights at this point. I haven't had as much time to really reflect and totally process what I've learned along the way. But I do know one thing. Um, as Legion came out, my boss, Tom Chilton, who'd been game director of World of Warcraft from 2008 onwards, and who'd been on World of Warcraft from 2003 onwards, he'd been a lead game designer on Ultima Online previously, like one of the real godfathers in the MMO genre. Um, he was also wanting to move on to another project than Blizzard. 10 years, 15 years on games, quite a bit. And that left me looking to move into those very, very big shoes to fill. And as I, as I moved into that role, I was, I was excited. I mean, I was awestruck. I was humbled by the responsibility, but also was terrified. Um, and I think this was an extension of something that I had felt throughout my career. And that it, it, I still carry with me to this day. Uh, I think, you know, the convenient shorthand for it, imposter syndrome. You know, the idea that other people, the, you, like the other people looking to you, and theoretically, you're supposed to be a beacon of judgment and responsibility and guidance. But especially when you first come into a role, you don't necessarily know what you're doing. Um, and I, I look forward to reading the forum threads tomorrow. Ian finally admits he has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> But whether it was me first coming into creative brainstorming meetings and feeling it's entirely uncomfortable, or unsure how to bear the mantle of leadership, or you know, unsure how to bear the responsibilities of guiding a team of 300 brilliant developers to create a game that millions of players are, are expecting and waiting for, um, it's something that I think is natural. So I think first off, if this is something that you feel in any area of your life, know that you're not alone know that I think it's a healthy, natural part of, of this process, moving into a new role, of course you're not an expert at the role. Like, I was comparing myself to somebody who had done it for almost a decade, and I'm comparing myself on my first day in the job to his eighth year in the job. For me, I, I try to keep this in mind, it helps keep me, I think, humble and grounded. Um, that crucible of ideas I talked about a couple slides earlier, you know, if I wake up one day and I think, oh no, yeah, I'm, I'm the greatest game director, I was born to do this, maybe I'm not running all of my ideas past as many people as I possibly can. And ultimately, you know, trust in the process that got you to the place where you are, whether it's the leaders who promoted you directly, whether it's a test that you passed, some screening that you made it through, others place their faith in you, have their judgment in, you know, in your ability to excel. And clearly, if you're comparing yourself with them and you think they're so great, it might mess up. <clears throat> so, that brings us back to August 2018, as I stand here. Um, I am super excited to join all of you in exploring PAX this weekend. If you see me out and about the convention anywhere, please don't hesitate to come up and say hi. Always happy to chat. And after, can't wait to get back to Irvine and to continue building the next chapter of this journey for myself, for my team, for millions of players around the world. Thank you. Welcome to PAX 2018.